So I think with the recent approval of Recaprib, we've learned that there's some subtle differences uh, between Olaparib and Recaprib. I get it that there's some similarities, as you outlined, but, but Katie, what are some of the differences in the toxicities between Recaprib and Olaparib? Yeah, so, um, so, so there are differences, um, and, and why they're happening, we don't quite uh, understand, but they're really kind of different drugs. They're metabolized through different SIP pathways, so that's one important thing to know. So the drug-drug interactions between the two drugs and Aripirib actually should be paid attention to because you can have toxicities there that, are, that differ from PARP to PARP. Um, specifically for Rucaparib and Olaparib, you see um, effects on um, uh, liver and um, uh, renal um, uh, kind of transport molecules. So you have um, um, displacement of creatinine um, by MATE1, MATE2, and OCT. Um, uh, in Rucaparib and a little bit in Olaparib. Yeah, you do see there. Yeah. And yeah. a little bit. And so that translates in the Rucaparib program into about a 21% uh, grade one through four increase in creatinine that really tends to be clinically not all that relevant. Correct. Um, Is that your experience, Rob? Yeah. It's not that clinically Absolutely, relevant. Absolutely, because you know, and that during the conduct of these trials, we were concerned about acute kidney injury. Right. And so uh, what we started to do was to send patients for renal scans, and we realized they would come back with renal real uh, GFR estimates of 90. Right. When that didn't use creatinine as an estimate. They didn't yeah. use creatinine as an estimate, yeah. Right. She's absolutely right. And then you also see the elevation in transaminases, right. um, which really is predictable um, right around cycle one day 15. They right. can bump pretty high. The bilirubin doesn't tend to go up as much, and truthfully, we don't know why that's happening. But as long as you follow High's law, which is sort of this combination of how high the transaminases are with the bilirubin, as long as you don't have elevated bilirubin or you're really high grade fours, you just treat through it. Right. It comes back down, and it does not happen again. But, but that's really unique to Rucaparib. As long as you know how to manage it, it's not right. this rate-limiting step, but you have to know it's going to happen, potentially. L let's spend a few minutes and talk about the uh, side effect profile of Neuraparib. Godfrey, tell us about what the label says and what your experience is with the toxicities associated with Neuraparib. I think what sets Neuraparib a little bit apart is the hematologic toxicity regarding platelets. Um, that there is a higher chance of thrombocytopenia and especially in the early uh, phase, the first two to four weeks. So the guidelines are to watch that closely. Um, I do a weekly CBC, um, and if the platelets drop, uh, address that, hold the drug, re-escalate when they normalize, and depending on the degree of a drop, you may even just reduce the dose. Um, other than that, it's not a, not a problem that persists throughout the trial. So it's really an initial finding. Um, so weekly you, CBC is just the first Weekly part. CBC the first, yeah. and then beyond that, when you're out a month, then you can go on to regular checks every four weeks. Okay. It, it is, and that's not seen for laparip and also not seen for rucaparib. Right. Other, all other things like the anemia around 20% being severe, three or four, are very similar. Um, also, neutropenia, very comparable. It, it's really unique, I think, that we have to monitor platelets more closely when, talk, when uh, treating with neuraparib. Right. And, and I think the only other kind of mm -hmm. nuanced swelling we saw was a little bit more hypertension, mm -hmm. which, uh, um, you know, in the label it says that, that neuraparib interferes with the metabolism of norepinephrine and right. dopamine. Right. So not only, which is idiosyncratic and mm -hmm. off-target, mm -hmm. that's again unique, you talked about the unique things that happen mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. rucaparib, this is something that's unique for neuraparib, and it's associated also, there's also some, some tachycardia, yeah. also very rare, probably, like you said, the LFTs are probably not clinically relevant, this is also probably not going to be. You know, but I think a lot of people are, uh, at least what I'm hearing is that they're very nervous about these kind of potential effects. But I think, you know, we have, a, these are all uh, side effects that we know how to handle. Right. And we have done a great job. I mean, it's something like we've seen with bevacizumab, for instance, right. where we have that kind of hypertension where we're going to multiple lines of uh, so, so Matt, But again, you're sitting in a room full of experts that have used Yeah, that's true. The average clinician out there hasn't written for a PARP inhibitor. Yeah, right. You know, so that's right. it's, it's novel, mm. it's new. There's a lot of education that has to happen That's to right. feel comfortable with these. To side feel effects. absolutely. So are these the same? Is it is it you know chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, but it's all ice cream? <laughs> I, think or, to, I think you have to. You know, Katie's points are real. That they are different drugs. They have different mechanisms. Different amount of PARP trapping, perhaps, etc. Right. That leads to some different toxicities, unique pathways of clearance. 
Yeah, Rob, to is be the seen. efficacy the same, though, at least? So, I mean, I, we've, we've talked about it, right? We, if you were able to line up all of the, the studies that had those same patient populations, you'd probably see pretty close to the same efficacy. But what Matt's talking about, I think, is really critical. As we move on, we talked about what's next. When we move on on the PARP, these other nuances in their actions may actually become relevant. Right. PARP trapping may be really relevant for something that we might use in combination with it. And so the, their differential abilities may not. And I think the other thing I'd add about the side effect profile is that we're still pretty early in this process. You know, part, the first Not an elaborate. I was saying, well, elaborate. Elaborate. Well, we well, hold on. We hold have on. lots no. of elaborate. Of course, we're switching from no, no. capsule to tablet, yeah, so there's some changes. <laughs> okay. yeah. we, you think about it. The first report in phase one that was published was only 2009. So, I mean, I wouldn't say we had, you know, and, and what I mean by this is that the, the relationship between what PARP is actually doing to the adverse event profile is something we're still learning. But let me give you an example. And also, so, no, no, I think I agree with Rob. I think we're moving out of the clinical trial setting into the real world. Right. And, yes. and that applies specifically for a very severe side effect like MDS. Right. And secondary leukemias. Now, they're all reported at very low incidences, but it is on the label. It, it's a serious complication. Um, and I think we just have to be alert and aware um, that that may, may not reflect the true incidence of this, considering that these patients have had multiple lines of platinum, now may be getting a second line of a PARP inhibitor. Right. They've been on a laparip, they may be retreated with recaparip, so I think that's something we have to be alert and watchful.